Good evening, Dungeon Masters. I'm Baron Drop. There are some truths that we as Dungeon Masters need to grapple with in order to improve our D&D games, and many of them aren't pleasant to hear. Dungeon mastering for your friends is a conflict of interest. However, that isn't to say you shouldn't do it. Obviously, we're most likely to play D&D with our friends, but when we belly up to the table, we must be able to clearly state which of the two relationships is more important at that moment. You must be willing to answer, which do you value more, the game or the friendship? This might sound extreme, but if you play D&D long enough, you will eventually run into an uncomfortable situation among players. An obvious and easy example is the player who you thought was everyone's friend, yet in-game only wants to edgelord murder hobo their way through every bar wench in combat encounter at the expense of the other player's enjoyment. But a more complicated situation might include a romantic couple with their own personal relationship issues that arise during a game session. For example, the group may be asked to wait on a player's tardy partner for over an hour, all so they can avoid a personal argument between them later on. And I'm sure you can come up with other situations situations where human sympathies allow for human shortcomings to get in the way of playing D&D. Allowing situations like this to happen once or maybe twice is fine, but when interpersonal stress becomes a pattern, truthfully, it becomes a D&D anti-pattern. When this happens, ponder the original question. Which do you value more, the game or the friendship. Sure, you might want to game with these people under ideal circumstances, but under degraded circumstances, you must be willing to either excise the players from the group or excise the game. If addressing the issues with the players ends up untenable or goes nowhere, it's time to either kick them out of the group or start playing Crocodile instead. If D&D is truly more important, you must be willing to kick any player from your group. And frankly, your players should know you reserve the right to do this for the sake of the game. Just as you eventually have to make a decision between the game and your friends, you also have to make a decision of which specific players in the group to make the most happy. You can't please everyone. So which player do you pick? The answer should always be yourself. As the dungeon master, you're the one designing the game world, prepping the encounters, and planning game sessions. Everyone else, even the math core power gaming wizards, are putting far less effort into the game than you are. Therefore, you should be the one rewarded with the type of game you want to play. Not only will failing to do this result in dungeon master burnout, but failing to favor yourself inadvertently means you'll be picking favorites among the players. Interestingly, the confluence of this particular truth, you can't please everyone, and the prior truth, playing D&D with friends as a conflict of interest, converge into a self-solving solution. If you favor playing D&D and are willing to tightly curate your player group, even at the risk of disinviting a few friends, and then further curate that group by cutting players who aren't highly interested in the game you want to play, you'll tightly pack your game sessions with a small handful of highly engaged players. Sure, sometimes players being bored at the table or not paying paying attention during combat is a symptom of your own poor dungeon mastering, but that boredom is just as frequently caused by players who just show up to spend time with their friends. Uninviting players who treat the game sessions like mall rats treat a food court, a convenient place to hang out, will absolutely make your game's narrative more engaging and compelling because everyone remaining will be deeply engaged. I'd like to take a brief moment to thank this video's sponsor, Unique Pieces' Calamity and Mythical Dice Collection, live on Kickstarter right now. These unique pieces of art aren't your average gaming dice. These dice capture various mythical creatures and calamities in handmade resin dice sets for a truly one-of-a-kind piece of art. Each dice set displays intricate details like hand-painted hieroglyphics, runic inscriptions, and even contains statuettes depicting figures from fantasy with each set telling an epic story. Additionally, every set comes in a custom collector's box exclusive for Kickstarter backers so you can keep your Calamity encasing dice under lock and key when not in use. If you want to add some legendary flavor to your next gaming session, check out Unique Pieces' Kickstarter using the link in the description below. Thanks again to Unique Pieces for sponsoring this video. 
While the game world, its inhabitants, and their motivations might be yours to design, the story belongs to the players. In a nutshell, if you already know the story, you simply don't need the players, and you should go write a novel instead. Any campaign should respect the authority and autonomy of the players and their characters. A lack of autonomy will at best lead to boredom, or at worst lead to anger. Players who feel like they're being dragged through a series of events with minimal impact on the outcomes, or who have their decisions effectively overridden by Dungeon Master Deus Ex Machina will quickly check out of the game. With that being said, if you have a direction you want the story to go, there are Dungeon Mastering concepts which can help you do that. Regardless, the decisions the players make should have true ramifications on the game world, and their actions should feel like they truly matter. To guide the story while respecting player autonomy, however, have any characters you'd rather the players not deal with till late in the game assert their authority through henry or lieutenants, and only reveal a final antagonist under terminal time crunch as they're finalizing their machinations. To use the terrible 2000 Dungeons & Dragons film as an example, the main characters know of the antagonist Profian and his intentions taking over the mage's council, but have to deal with Profian's lieutenant, Domidor, while they're looking for the story's MacGuffin. It's not until the end of the adventure that the protagonists finally have an opportunity to confront Profian directly, planning adventures with the assumption that your antagonists will accomplish a particular action or goal, such as spellcasting a particular spell, or activating a portal, or even running away from combat successfully, directly imposes authority over player character autonomy, and robs a sense of narrative control away from the players. Improvisational skills are more important than prepping a session. Prussian military theorist Helmuth von Moltke, while studying at the military academy in Frankfurt an der Oder, synthesized Immanuel Kant's philosophy of epistemology and Johann Gottlieb Fichte's philosophy of subjectivity into military strategy. In his graduate thesis, On Strategy, a Critical Analysis of the Art of War, he coined the phrase, no plan survives contact with the enemy. It's from this military theory that the old D&D meme draws. No prep survives contact with the players. But to understand specifically why this meme is so profound, we can turn to Moltke's original military thesis on which the joke is derived. Moltke asserted that it was impossible to anticipate the complexity of warfare, and so military planners must be prepared to adapt to changing circumstances on the ground, to maintain flexibility in order to preserve combat initiative, that any strategic planning should have flexibility built into the plan and that respecting the limits of your military intelligence, also known as the fog of war, is paramount to strategic decision making. Moltke dictates that planning is a necessary but imperfect activity. Therefore, planning to be flexible is most consequential to victory. And all of Moltke's points are directly translatable to dungeon mastering. When preparing a session, the right things to focus on, according to Moltke, would be the terrain, the composition, and the psychology of the enemy and their strategic goals. Therefore, having a regional map, the layout of any relevant dungeons, brief descriptions of the region's inhabitants, the structure, composition, and personality of the various factions, as well as the general understanding of their goals are likely the only things you need to prepare. Everything else you can either improvise at the table or reassess between sessions. Did the player characters make off with a magic item last session that a dragon cult has been looking for? Then prepare an encounter with the strike team sent by the cult for your next session. Further, look at what assets and ideology the cult has to see how the strike team will operate. A militant populist cult might send thugs to attack the players right out in the open daylight, while a secretive cabal of magic users might opt for a scry teleport hoodwink tactic. Having your factions react between game sessions to maintain their strategic initiatives will radically decrease your time spent preparing and gives you room to improvise on everything else. Focus on providing yourself tools tools to do that improvisation, like statements of faction assets, goals, and ideologies, as well as a faction event log, and you'll have everything you need to keep the game moving forward. Are there any other uncomfortable truths you can think of? If so, leave them in the comments below and I'll include them in a follow-up video. If you'd like to help me make more content like this in the future, please consider supporting me on Patreon or becoming a channel member. Thanks for watching, Dungeon Masters, and until next time, good night.